Good morning and welcome, Trinity Tigers. Welcome to Learning Together uh, live webinar series um, as part of lifelong learning initiatives presented by the Trinity University Office of Alumni Relations. I'm Barbara Ann Stevens, class of, yes, hard to believe, <laughs> 1966. Ooh. And this is my dear friend Jim Comer, also a member of the class of 1966. Uh, we feel like we are uh, appropriate hosts for this discussion today because I cared for my own father for almost 10 years uh, as he was going through dementia. And I knew Jim's parents very well from the time we first met. And it's my distinct pleasure to be introducing Jim to you today. And we thought we'd begin by letting him share a brief memory of how we first met. Absolutely. We met first about five weeks into our freshman year of 1962. And we were both running for offices in the freshman class. Barbara Ann was running for treasurer. And she got up at the assembly, made this wonderful speech. And I was running for president, and I got up and made a, probably not such a wonderful speech. Barbara Ann got elected. She won. <laughs> I lost. <laughs> and we became friends from that day on and have stayed friends through thick and thin ups and downs all these years. 54. Wow. Uh, but who's counting? Oh, really? Right? Right. So um, what we want to do today is ask Jim some questions about uh, his uh, – process of caring for his parents. He um, is a well-known presenter. He is a speech writer. He's a keynote speaker. He's the author, most importantly, of a book called When Roles Reverse, A Guide to Parenting yes. Your Parents. And he is going to share with us some of his struggles and his joys over a 14-year period of caring for his dear parents. And we're hoping that this webinar is going to help families plan ahead oh, yeah. and be more prepared to handle the physical as well as emotional challenges and minefield of caregiving. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Then our first question today to you, Jim, is gonna be, do you feel that you were prepared to become your parents' caregiver? Absolutely not. I was the perfect example of not being prepared. I was living in California, LA. I was a speechwriter for a CEO of a big company. And it was February the 20th, 1996. I'm sound asleep, 7 a.m. I get a phone call and it's my parents' next door neighbor in Dallas. In 34 years of living next to my parents, she has never called me. And I knew instantly, my whole body reacted. I knew it was gonna be bad news. And it was. She said, Jim, your daddy's walking in circles, kind of in a daze in the front, front yard, and I think he's having a stroke. And she was right. And in that instant, my life changed forever. I mean, within seven or eight hours, I was on a plane headed back to Dallas. And when I arrived and got to the hospital where dad was in intensive care, he couldn't walk, he couldn't talk, and he had no control of his bodily functions. And my poor sweet mother, who had early dementia, was totally confused. She didn't know what was happening. She just knew it was bad. And the doctors looked at me as the man who had all the answers. You think I had the answers? Nope. Not a one. Didn't know anything because my father hadn't talked to me about anything. But that didn't matter. I had to make decisions starting immediately. First, they told me, you've got one week and then he can be in this hospital a week, and then you've got to be in rehab. Well, that would seem simple, except we had no family in Dallas, so the rehab couldn't be in Dallas. Our family was 200 miles south in the Austin area, so I had to get him to Austin for a rehab where I'd have some support. So two days later, I fly down to Austin. My cousins meet me. We went to four rehabs, one after the other, that afternoon. I'd never been to one before. I didn't know what I was looking for. We got to St. David's. And this wonderful nurse smiled at me and just made me feel so welcome. So I chose St. David's. Right. Well, and isn't that the way we make big choices? Yes. I think that's the way we make choice to come to Trinity Yeah, University. they made us feel good. Exactly. And so I signed up for St. David's. They said, we'll bring him down in, in an ambulance on Monday, and Medicare will pay for it. I like that. Get home to Dallas that night. I tell mother. She says, I can still, I can see her. 
She says, Jim, that's just fine for Daddy, but I am staying right here in Dallas. I am not leaving my house. Oops. Well, of course, she didn't know that she couldn't stay alone. Daddy had taken over everything. She couldn't be by herself, but she didn't know it. So I then had to plot how I was going to get her down to my cousin's house in Georgetown, which is a, an Austin suburb, and they had agreed to keep her for six or seven weeks while I tried to decide what to do, but I had to get her there. So I came up with this great scientific concept. I know that we want to share this with the audience. It's called <laughs> therapeutic lying. That's right. You'll be using it. And I, on, on the night before they were taking Dad down, Sunday night, I packed the trunk of their car with as many of Mother's clothes as I could get into it. I'm sure it wasn't a pretty job of packing, but I did the best I could. Monday morning, here came the whopper. I walked right into her. She's sitting in the breakfast room drinking her coffee, reading the Dallas Morning News, and I said, Mama, would you like to go get some ice cream? <laughs> My mother never turns down ice cream, ever, not even at 8 o'clock in the morning. She smiled. She put down the paper. She got up. She happily walked with me, got into the car, and we drove away from her home of 34 years, and she never saw it again. Mm. Now, don't think I'm a bad guy. We stopped at the first Dairy Queen we came to, <laughs> and we got her the biggest, gooeyest chocolate sundae, and we headed down I-35 to Georgetown. I kept waiting for her to you know, say something. She never mentioned a thing. She was too busy commenting on the colors of passing cars. I got her to my cousin's house, I kissed her goodbye, and I headed for the airport. I'd been gone 11 days, and I didn't realize this was just the tiniest, tiniest beginning of those 14 years of caregiving. And at that point, you were still thinking you would be able to stay oh. in L.A. Oh, yeah, I had a great job. I'd been there 13 years. That's I had right. friends and a church That's and a right. life. I thought I was going to stay. I thought I was going to do this long distance. Well, uh, we know that the story uh, changes dramatically it does. Uh, from L.A. Uh, why do you think that so many parents and their adult children avoid having these conversations, these realities about the aging process and what it will mean for, for all of us. Yeah, and I'm a perfect example. I mean, once mother began to have memory problems, which was about five years before dad's stroke, I began to talk to my father, asking him, you know, I was asking about her condition and he didn't want to talk about that at all. He was in complete denial. Did never, he never said the A word ever. In, his, in the next four, never said it. But I knew there was a problem here, and I kept trying to talk to my dad about possibly selling the house, moving down to Central Texas, making plans. He would hear none of it. Every time I brought the subject up, he would literally, if I pushed you out, he'd get up from the table, he would walk out of the room. Well, and it's important, I think, to say, tell me about your dad and how many combat missions did he fly in oh, World yeah, War II? My dad II? was quite a guy. He'd flown 75 combat missions over over Germany in World War II. He was a real strong individual. But boy, he, he didn't want to hear about he leaving his house. He didn't want that. And he just didn't want to talk about this. Here's the deal. I let him get by with that for five years. Every Christmas, every summer I'd come and he wouldn't talk. And instead of saying, Dad, I, what I really should have done, I should have walked out of the room with him. I should have cornered him, literally, and said, Jed, we have got to talk about this. We have to talk about this. I'm not going to be able to help you when the time comes if I don't know anything. I'm eager to, but I still didn't do that. You know, I did not do it, and I paid a big price for it. And that's what happens to so many people, families all over the country, and people watching this show right now. If I could reach out and touch you, I know there are people listening right now who know you should have these conversations, but for some reason, you haven't done it. It could be the adult children in their 30s, 40s, 50s, or it could be the parents in their 60s, 70s, 80s who know you should talk together, but you just haven't been able to do it. And for the, I'm thinking for kids, it's often that you don't want to feel, you don't want to make your parents feel like you're being pushy or you want to hurt their feelings or you don't want them to get upset. And here's what I'm telling you. It's a lot more important to have the conversation than whether they get upset or not. If there's tears, if there's raised voices, if they get upset, that's okay. Have the conversation either way. And if you're the adult, I mean, if you're the parent, what a great gift to give your children the documents they need, all the things that, are, that they're going to have to need when they take care of you. If you can do that, you're doing a great gift. Absolutely. You know, that it's so important to have that conversation. And don't postpone it. Have it now. You know, we've got Thanksgiving 
and Christmas coming right up. What a great time for families to talk to each other. Not maybe on Turkey Day itself, but maybe the day after, in between football games. Take a couple of hours. If you've got brothers and sisters there, that's even better. Get the family together around a table. Have the conversation. That's right. Because it's precious time. And you can ask the questions that's been on your mind, and who knows what's going to come up. You know, in my book, I've got this section called 50 Questions That Will Save You Time, Money, and Tears. And there's actually space under them to write the answers. And I get, bring the book if you got it. You can get it on Amazon. Bring the book. T say that Jim Comer made you do this. You don't, it's not you doing it. It's me telling you to do it. Because if you get the answers to these questions, you're going to be so far ahead of the game. You know, yeah. um, you know, Woody Allen, I think we had a slide saying Woody Allen said 80% of life is showing up. Right. But you want to show up prepared. You want to show up prepared. And um, this is the way to do it. Well, and talk about uh, showing up prepared. Let's talk about surprises. Will oh, you? wait, you know something I forgot? What? I'm about to leave, leave. I'm about to leave a very important subject. We don't, one of the things you want to talk about in this conversation with your parents are documents, essential okay. documents. You know, it's funny that I'm about to skip that because so many people don't, don't. want to talk about it, <laughs> especially this first one. Wills. Do you know Seven out of 10 Americans do not have a will. 10 out of 10 are gonna die. I know because I Googled it. <laughs> Google never lies. Yes, everybody's gonna need a will. And yet, so many people don't have them. Prince, the great rock star, died a few years ago, I think three years ago maybe, had a $200 million estate, no will. His brothers and sisters, I think four of them, have been fighting in court about it ever since he died. God knows how much lawyer's money they have spent. It's going right out of the estate. Absolutely. Aretha Franklin had been sick for over a year with cancer. No will. $80 million estate. Mm -hmm. And then there was, what's what you told me about? Um, Malcolm Forbes. The great financier. Great financier. Yeah. yeah. You would think of all people in the world, Malcolm, who talked to everybody about how they should do their money would have a will, but he Absolutely. didn't. I think there's a denial that a lot of people, if I don't have a will, I'm not going to die. That's, right. That's a mistake. That's so a you mistake. need, if, and, and you know, so if your parents don't have a will, that is absolutely number one. And oh, those of you in 30s and 40s, it's a great idea for you to have a will too, because we just don't know when things are going to happen, and you want to protect your family. Then there's powers of attorney. That is really important, and my parents didn't have them yet. So we got the powers of attorney done, and it's so important to have this because you need a health care power of attorney so that someone you trust can make health care decisions for you when you can. If you're incapacitated. Absolutely. And then you need a durable power of attorney so that the person you really think highly of and trust can make financial and legal decisions for you. And you really need to pick the right person for both of these jobs, not just somebody who you like, or maybe the eldest child. The eldest child may not be the one. In fact, maybe none of the children are the one. I don't know. You need to pick somebody who's really responsible, who you can trust to put your interests first. That choice of the person is very, very important. Absolutely. And then there's the one that I didn't even put on here. It's called directive to physicians or living will. For me, there were two things I was concerned about. I did not and do not want to be stuck on a feeding tube for months and months and months. I just don't want that. Maybe a few days if they need this, but not for months, nor do I wish to be on a respirator for indefinitely. If that time comes, I want people empowered to turn off the switch and let me go. But if I don't have it in writing, they're going to keep me alive. Last one, do not resuscitate. I hate that word, resuscitate. Mm -hmm. It just makes me Never have it liked it. Hurts. Mm -hmm. You know what happens with them? Often what this happens when in the last days of a person's life, maybe the last weeks, maybe they've got a terrible heart condition and they're, and, 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 th and they're having a heart episode. And if you don't have a do not resuscitate form, the doctors or the EMS is going to come in, they're going to break open your chest, they're going to massage your heart so you can live for another week or two. Do you want that? I don't want that. But it's your choice. If you want them to do every single thing, well, that's fine. 
But if you're like me and you don't want that, you need the do not resuscitate form and you need one for in the hospital and one for out of the hospital. And you'd be able to put them someplace where they can, you can get to them quickly or your right. caregivers can so they can show the doctors or the EMS when they show up that you don't want that. That's right. That's right. Those are really important. Documentation. And you know, also, I'm going to throw this one in. And you need to make some funeral decisions. I mean, so many people don't write it down. They think they told somebody and it's okay. No, no. If it's not written down and notarized, it doesn't count. I want to be cremated. And I want to have a memorial service. And I know what I want to have at my service. Now, my father was very different. When I finally talked to him about this, he said, Jim, you make the decisions. I won't be there. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> Doesn't that sound like my daddy? That is just And then he said, I love this line. He said, funerals are for the living. And as soon as he said that, I was set free. And I had this fabulous memorial service for him for what I wanted. Because he, as he said, he wasn't there. There you go. Yep. Very wise he is. <laughs> and, um, let's talk about uh, important lessons that you've learned about dealing with dementia. Uh. Well, the most important thing was that I didn't know anything. Mm. I got back, when I finally made the decision in the middle of the summer, about five months after the stroke, I made the decision to quit my job and move back to Texas. And when I got here in October, I realized I didn't know anything about Alzheimer's. I mean, when I would come home at Christmas or come home for a few days in the summer, my mama was good at baking. Mm. She had that great sense of humor, and Daddy would cover for her. So I didn't know how bad it was. I really didn't. But boy, it didn't take me long to learn because I remember going to my mother's room. She had about 70 dresses, you know, in this closet. But she would only wear five of them. Jim, I can't wear that dress. It's stolen. <laughs> you, want me, you want me to be arrested and go to the Hooskow? My mother's one of the few people in America that would have said Hooskow. <laughs> she really didn't believe they were hers. And I'd say, Mama, I gave you this dress. No, you didn't. It's stolen. Wow, I was, I, was, I was blown away, honestly. And then came the day a couple of weeks later where she said that she wanted to go see her sister, Estelle, oh. in Smithville, Texas, about 60 miles away where they were raised. And I'm, of course, I'm a rookie caregiver. I'm not very smart. And I said, Mama, we can't go see Estelle. She's in heaven. And that was a news flash to my mother. She had no idea that her sister was dead. It was brand new again to her. She started crying, sobbing, her shoulders shaking, tears coming down. She cried for like 15 minutes, and I'm sitting there going, what have I done? Mm -hmm. Well, I just, I didn't know any better. And so the next day, I managed to get an appointment. I think it was the next day for a, with an Alzheimer's expert because I needed some help. And I walked into her, and I said, you know, I don't think I can do this. And she said, honey, I hear you don't have much choice. Of course, she was right. I said, well, what do I do? And she gave me the best advice I've ever gotten on caregiving. She said, quit trying to drag your mother into your world. She can't go there anymore. Instead, you must go into her world. Go into her world. And I got it. I mean, when she said it, boing, I absolutely got it. And I started doing that from that moment on and for the next 14 years. And here's what it looked like in those early days. Mother still was pretty sharp, and she was fun and good sense of humor. So I could, that's where she was then. As time went on, a couple of years, she began to lose some cognitive ability. And so I had to adjust to the new reality and meet her where she was in. And then maybe, I don't know, seven or eight years into it, there came the day when I showed up at, at the nursing home and she had no idea who I was. She looked at me blankly and I realized that we had a new reality and I had to adjust to that. So I said, hey mama, Jim Comer, your firstborn, <laughs> how you doing? <laughs> and I just introduced myself to her. And she smiled and was happy to see this new stranger in her life who seemed to be real friendly. And so for, from then on, I've introduced myself to my mother scores of times. Mm. And that worked. Mm. And then as time went on further, maybe 
10 years in, she got to where she couldn't make full sentences, but she would maybe have a phrase or a word that I could understand. I would go with the phrase of the day and try to deal with that. She often wanted to go to the garden, so I spent so much time in gardens. I had never been a garden person, especially in a hot Texas summer, but oh my goodness, she loved the flowers, so we spent hundreds of hours in the garden. Mm. And then those last couple of years, she didn't have any words at all, right. no speech. So I had to try to look at her smile or her body language or whatever and just hug her and sing to her. She somehow liked my singing. Aww. And um, do the things that I knew she loved because she no longer could tell me. I just had to kind of connect with her in a feeling level. But in each case, I matched where she was, not where I wanted her, her to, to be. be. You bet. You, you bet. know, and, and that goes into this whole thing about, you know, uh, adult children often making the big mistake that we've talked about of correcting their parents. That's right. You've That's seen right. that happen, haven't you? That's right. Absolutely, I've seen it happen. And and it's it's pointless. It is. You know, my daddy would, would say 10 minutes after having eaten breakfast, when are you going to fix my breakfast? There you go. And uh, my stepmother would say, you know, would want to say, Bob, you just had breakfast, and we'd have that discussion again. And that made him angry because it made him feel out of control and that he did not know what was going on. Right. Had she said, well, we will have breakfast. Let me just finish up here in the kitchen, and then I'll get to your breakfast. Right. It would have ended because he would not have remembered That's right. Three minutes later, that he had asked. But for the breakfast. trouble is that the and the, it's difficult to to be uh, one who develops those coping skills. I want to talk about your dad's coping skill. Okay, let's. Oh talk no, no about I've got one more though. I've got one oh. thing I want to say. Uh, I've noticed that often, just to go to build on what you said, I've seen adult children out in public. I've oh, seen them in the nursing home. Them. I've seen them at Luby's Cafeteria, even at church. And they're talking to their, their parent and they're saying, I just told you that. I said that three times in a row. I've said it. Why don't you remember? I just said it. Why don't you? you you've seen that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, if they could remember, they would, they would remember. Mm -hmm. Don't criticize them for that because, you know, it doesn't help any. You know, when you are faced with a choice between your parents being right, or whatever right means, not making a mistake, getting the right name or place or whatever, and you being kind, when you're weighing those two things, go for kind every single time. You just can't go wrong by being kind. I know that my mother remembered the fact that I frequently ran out of gas as a younger man. And she had that in her head. It was there. So every time I'd come to see her at the independent living those first three or four years, she'd say, Jim, how are you fixed for gas? <laughs> Don't lie to your mama. How are you fixed for gas? And I'd say, full tank, mom, full tank, whether I had full tank or not. I'd say, full tank. And then she, once she got that into her head, she might ask me, how are you fixed for gas? Four, five, six, seven, eight times. And my job as a loving son was to answer her. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times without comment, without putting her down. And I've got to tell you, it wasn't easy. But most of the time, I managed it. Let's talk about scotch. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. A favorite topic. <laughs> but I think it's an important story about your dear dad and about the the facility where they were living. Yeah, you know, it's, um, it, it, it is uh, uh, two of the qualities that I think are are most important in surviving caregiving is having a sense of humor, which is a saving grace, because I don't know how a caregiver makes it without a sense of humor. Yeah, I agree. And also improvisation. So I'm gonna, ask, I'm gonna get to the improvisation, but sense of humor, let me give you one example. My mother was 84 when she moved into independent living, and there was this 94-year-old man who just thought she was terrific. I mean, every time I'd walk through the lobby, he'd come up to he would sing my brother's praises. He just couldn't say enough great things about it. This happened over and over again. And finally, I thought, you know, Mother needs to know that she has an admirer. So I said, Mama, you know there's a 94-year-old man who thinks you are terrific? And she said, Honey, 
That's the kind I attract. <laughs> now, this is a woman with, with dementia who's still got that sense of humor. And I, those moments helped me so much because being able to laugh and to share that's great. And then you mentioned the scotch, and that then goes to improvisation because you are going to have to improvise as caregivers. Now, you can buy this book. You can buy any book. You can get, hear all sorts of lectures and TED Talks. But there's going to be scores of things for which you just can't imagine that you're going to have to deal with. And scotch was one of them. I mean, I knew my dad liked scotch. I just didn't know how much he liked his scotch. <laughs> when I got back to Texas, whoa, they got into independent living. He was on the fourth floor. As you said, he was a veteran. He found a World War II buddy who lived on the second floor. And many a night he would go down to the second floor to his buddy's room, and they would refight the war. And... Drink a little, no, drink a lot, a lot of, of scotch. scotch. And, you know, usually he would make it home. You know, battle 1030, when Hitler had put a bullet through his head again and the war was over, <laughs> Dad would head back to his room and almost always made it. But two times, not quite. <laughs> Those times he was walking down that long wall-to-wall -wall covered highway with that highway, <laughs> hallway <laughs> with that thick carpet, and he looked down at the carpet, and it just looked so appealing, and he lowered himself down to the carpet and went sound asleep, out cold. And then, of course, 15 minutes later, somebody walks down the hall, they see this body, they think stroke, heart attack, dead, they call the front desk. The front desk calls EMS. They send the people out. They take Dad to the hospital. The doctors are waiting. Diagnosis, bombed. <laughs> this happened twice in one year. And I got parent-teacher call. What are you going to do about your dad's drinking? Mm. Well, what do you tell a 90-year-old about drinking? Going to stunt your growth? <laughs> I don't know. Happen. I I didn't know. I honestly didn't know. So here's the improvisation. Here's what I want you to get. Here's this problem for which I had no solution. So what I did, I made an appointment with the, the independent living administrator, the man who run the place, right? And he was a Methodist minister. So I took him to lunch, and I said, what are we going to do? <laughs> we is the important one. What are we going to do about dad's drinking? Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and said, Jim, I just have so much respect for your father. What he did in World War II, all those missions over Germany, and then the way he takes care of your mother and, and, and helps to monitor her and care for her so that she can stay here with her dementia. Mm -hmm. And if it takes a little scotch for him to do it, it's okay with me. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I went, okay. And then over the next year, I actually did find a way. I just finally found that he had two gallons of scotch in his closet. <laughs> and when he was looking the other way, one night I, I, I got removed him out. I the removed source. them. Never mentioned it. We never talked about it. They just disappeared. And then I had to find out who his uh, supplier was. And it turned out to be the guy that used to live on the second floor who'd moved out. And I told him, you're cut off. Dad can't do it. No more. And that ended the drinking problem. But the sweetness of this administrator. Wasn't that? Wasn't that a surprise? Well, and th I mean, th a th huge that's surprise. One of the things you want to look for, when you're going to pick a long-term care facility, you need to really be smart about it. Don't get taken away by external grandeur. Chandeliers, not important. Fountains, totally not important. The, what counts is, is it clean? Is the food good? That is absolutely essential. essential. And how caring is the staff? The, the communication between staff and residents is the key. And in that key are the people who really do the care, and certainly in the assisted living and nursing home, they're called CNAs, right. Certified Nursing Assistants. They're the ones that do all the basic work that they really interact with your parents. And what you want is a place that has the lowest turnover of CNAs. Because if they're happy and they're, they're, they're in a good place, they're going to stay much more like than places that are not well run right. where they're unhappy. Right. And so if there's a low turnover rate and you can find it, that's a good sign. 
If there's a high turnover rate, and sometimes it's incredibly high, you want to avoid that place. Which is a great recommendation, and it's particularly a challenge right now because we have uh, such a high uh, employment rate right. that shifting jobs is not a difficult thing for some people to do. But as you point out, if the people are happy oh. working there, they have stayed there, that it means that the the senior management is valuing Absolutely. the work that they do in delivering that direct right. care. And paying them pretty well. Uh, yes, you know, the, the, Absolutely. Let's don't, it's hard I mean, if you work. If you're a CNA, which is very hard, and you can make the same salary down the road flipping hamburgers, you may go there unless you really care about being a good caregiver. I got to tell them about my favorite CNA. This young woman, I came in one night about, I don't know, 7 o'clock just to check. Mother had kind of already gone to bed, but this woman saw me come in, and she came right up to me, got in my face, and said, Mr. Comer, you know what your mama's shoes stink? <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> she said, both pair. <laughs> she had a house shoe. I had no idea that they stunk, and I wouldn't have known if this CNA had not been kind enough to tell me. And she and I had a good relationship, so she could be very frank. Now, this might not have been the manner in which her, her bosses would want her to tell me. <laughs> it worked for me because the next day I got Mama two new pair of shoes because the CNA knew me and connected with me. And I, I thought that was great. I loved it. It was. It was a good thing. Um, how about some final thoughts before we get to questions from our um, viewers? Why don't we talk about... Uh, your mother and the price she paid to have you as her son. Oh gosh, well that's, you know, mama, mama used to love to tell people, you know how much it cost me when, to go to the hospital when Jim was born? Four dollars a day. And he's been worth every penny of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I spent those 14 years trying to pay off that debt. You know, and um, I think maybe I, I came close, but I do know this. I learned so much from being a caregiver, things I could have never, ever learned on my own. For one thing, I had never been the most patient person in the world. But if you're a caregiver, you are going to learn patience. And it was a, it was a really gift for me to, to get that. Because I... I I feel that patience is the currency of love. Hmm. It's love active. Think how our parents had to be patient with us. As little kids, as teenagers, our ups and downs of our adult life, this was my chance to learn patience. So that was a gift. And the other one, to be real honest here, I had not been the most unselfish person in my life. I had been focused on myself and my career and what I wanted. It was all about me. But when I became a caregiver, that began to change. I'm not going to say I'm unselfish, but I got to the suburbs of unselfishness. <laughs> Maybe the outskirts. And that's, that was a gift, another gift, to learn patience, to be less selfish, to think of others instead of myself. Those are, those are gifts. And to know that when things get rough, and I don't get me wrong, there are a lot of rough times as a caregiver. There are going to be challenges, difficult days, hard decisions, frustration. That's going to happen. But there's also going to be so much sweetness and goodness and closeness that develops that you never would have had if you hadn't shown up. Absolutely. And in one of the things that we didn't talk about that I want to throw in here is that in the questions you, you ask your, your, yourself when you think about caregiving, you need to look at your brothers and sisters, and most of you will have brothers and sisters, and you need to be real clear about who's going to show up and really be a part of it, really care, and who's going to be missing in action. Mm. Because in most families, and you know, I have been all over the country speaking on this. Mm -hmm. I've got a slide here. We're going to find it. Uh, oh, well, maybe not. Okay, here we go. There's the book. It's, you can get it on Amazon. But I have spoken in 25 states on this subject. And over and over and over, when I'm signing books after it's over, people will come up to me and talk to me about how their brother or their sister does nothing. Mm -hmm. They aren't part of the care. And you just don't know. Sometimes everybody, all the children are part, and sometimes it's only one. And occasionally I've come across places where it wasn't anybody. 
So you need to know which of your brothers and sisters is going to be a part of it and what kind of a part. Are they going to show up and be real on, hands-on caregivers? Are they going to send money? Are they going to come and stay for two, day, two weeks a year while the real caregivers take a vacation? All of those are fine, but you need to know. And often, I hate to tell you, your brothers and sisters may surprise you for exactly. good or for ill. Exactly. But you, the better you know ahead of time, the better you can plan. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and that can start with that very first conversation. Oh, it absolutely Gathering can. Gathering people together. I'm, I'm thinking that having a little wine with that conversation yeah. might make things go absolutely. a little more uh, easily. But at any rate, you will see in that some some people would love to be there, but because of circumstances in their lives, they're divorced, they live you know, five states away, whatever their circumstance is, can prevent them from being right. there. But they can be supportive of the person who has the primary responsibility. And as they do that, they can they can become part of your ability to deal well with it. Absolutely. And you know, I, there's a there's a terminology that I use that because I kept hearing about this kind of uh, adult child. And who the, the one that lives in a fancy town, we'll say Dallas or San Francisco <laughs> or New York, and they're really not going to be part of the caregiving, but they're going to fly in once a year mm -hmm. for a day and a half. Mm -hmm. And they're going to criticize everything, everything that done. the real caregivers are doing. They will leave devastation in their wake. They will. I call these people drive-by caregivers. Pay no attention to them. If they're not on the ground giving care, seeing how things really are, they have no right to say anything. Don't pay attention to them. Don't let them affect you at all. Now, if they're willing to come in and spend a week or two and let, give the real caregivers a break and really see how things are, then they have a right to talk, but not for a day or two where they come in and criticize everything. They don't have that right. They haven't earned it. Don't let them do anything to the way you feel about yourself as a caregiver. Absolutely. I would, I would champion that, that thought as well. As well. Oh, I've so, got one more. The oh. black sheep of the family. You know, m many families have a black sheep. The person that your, your mother or your father or both of them has spent their entire life trying to win over and they've worried about. Now, this person may not be part of the caregiving, but this is the person you might bring in when you want to have that conversation. They might talk to that person more than they talk to the, the, the more responsible That's caregiver. That's right. Because they're so thrilled that he's back or she's back. Let that person help you have that conversation with your parents and get them to say things they might not to say to anybody else. I've seen that happen in families where the one that's the, 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 the outrageous child can get them to talk in ways that the more responsible one can't. And sometimes that's their real gift to the whole process. Exactly, exactly. Do we have any questions? We do, we do oh, have good, some good, questions. Good. And, um, I hope I have answers. Uh, well, this one is a very broad one, and you might want to uh, okay. address this. Uh, one of our viewers says, what is the conversation? Oh, what is the conversation? That's right. Well, okay. The most basic part is you want to find out what your parents expect and want as they age. Do they want to stay in their home as long as possible, no matter what? That's a perfectly valid decision if they can physically do it and if they are going to need help, that they can afford to have someone come in and help them. Or they may want to decide to sell the house and move to a smaller place or to a, a, um, an independent living. Mm -hmm. That's another good decision. But then where is that going to be? Can they afford it? What kind of place do they want? These are basic decisions, what they want and what they don't want. Exactly. They may say, I will not leave this town no matter what. My friends are here. I'm staying. Okay, that's very clear. We get that. That's what you want. And if you can make that happen, great. But at least you start knowing what's important to them. Exactly. And then, of course, finances. I hate to keep going back to that, but a lot of what we want may or may not be possible depending on what our financial situation is. And you need to learn what it is. And that's sometimes really touchy because kids don't want to feel like they're prying. But, and parents may be very protective of the finances, not letting people know. But you've got to have some idea exactly. or else you, it's hard to make plans for the future. I mean, if I want to live in a, a, a seven or $8,000 a month facility, 
and I don't have that kind of money, well, not going to happen. Right, right. Um, and I would, I would just say here that in, in my situation, my dad was wonderful about having all the documents that, that were necessary. Unfortunately, I didn't know where they were. Oh, that's typical. Didn't know where they were, and I was able to locate them pretty quickly with, with the help of, of someone in the family. But the second thing was he had had me sign a card a signature card for the bank. Well, that was wonderful. Oh, yeah. I knew it was there. I could access it if need be. The difference was he did not take me to meet his banker. Oh. And by the time the dementia had kicked in, that was an issue. And the bank, who had been dealing with him forever, and he was uh, a stockholder in the bank, um, they did not want to believe that he could not handle oh, his wow. his decisions anymore. Oh. And it became a very difficult situation. I understand it. I understand the the need to to be very secure in who you're right. dealing with. Right. But my recommendation would be if if you've chosen someone to be uh, in that role of having your power of attorney Take them with you. Absolutely. Say to them uh, in front of your banker, this is my daughter. I have the greatest confidence in her. And if the time comes when I'm not able to do things for myself, she's the one that's going to act in my behalf. And I trust her for that's that. That's perfect. The other thing is that I think it would be very wise as you meet with your, the doctors, if they will give you a letter I ended up having to have a letter to deal with the Social Security Administration oh. that, by the way, does not recognize powers of attorney. Mm. They do not do that. So we had to go around a route. And one of the things that, that I found to be real helpful there was I said to the, the clerk, I said, now I know I'm not the first person that needed to do this, and I know you know how to get this handled. Mm -hmm. You tell me what to do, and I will gladly do it. And that's when she said, can you get a letter from your daddy's See, doctor? You didn't know. I said, yes, I can do that. And she said, I'm printing the form 385 for you. Perfect. Take it with you and bring it back. Mm -hmm. And we got things handled. But the one thing you know you're not going to do is be able to challenge something of the size of the Social Security no. Administration. But you, but you found a way around it. Exactly. You know, my exactly. father was just the opposite. He loved to go to the Union State Bank in Georgetown. And he would make me go take him there regularly. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I must have gone with him, I don't know how many, 40, mm -hmm. 50 times. So they knew me, and of course my father was unforgettable. So they they saw me coming with my father time after time after. So when the time came, there was no issue because right. he had done, without even making it wasn't formal. I was just there with him. That's right. And of course That's I'm right. yelling at him because he's not wearing his hearing aids, and so we, they could, it was kind of hard to miss us. <laughs> and, and so uh, they knew me well. But I think you're absolutely right. Let the bankers know you. How many more questions? So we we do. We have someone. Um, who has uh, a 96-year-old mother-in-law, so like your family, yes, good genes, they right. li living long time. She's been through some uh, uh, difficult events, uh, but she kind of has a switch that turns on and off. You know, it's kind of the, the good twin and the evil twin. Uh -huh. And uh, she says that she is learning patience and uh -huh. wants to... Uh, applaud what you have had to say that patience is critical. It is absolutely and that critical. We, that, that you're certainly right about that. Um, how often do you think uh, you should revisit the conversation uh, in case their wishes change? Yeah, well, you know, because you, circumstances it, do change. You first, it's, it's very important. I want to make this clear. It's not a one-time conversation. That's right. You just have to start. What I'm wanting you to do, those of you out there who haven't done it during Thanksgiving and Christmas, have the first one. Get your, your brothers and sisters there. Have the conversation. But it's an ongoing thing. It's conversation. Shuns with an S. You'll have them going forward, and you'll keep having them. And you just have to... Just like I had to go into my mother's world and keep changing it, 
the conversation needs to broaden as time goes on. Exactly. And it will change and things will come up. And they'll may change their mind about things and that's that's okay too. Absolutely. But you just Absolutely. have to keep talking. Keep the keep the doors open to the conversation. Uh, and I think, you know, in, in terms of how often to revisit that, you know, uh, when there's something that you perceive uh, is changing about your parents, somebody's falling, which is always a big indicator Indeed. that it's time to revisit that conversation one more time. Mm-hmm. You know, you've indicated that you'd love to stay in your home uh, until your last breath, Mama. Well, you've fallen twice this year. Do you think we need to talk about this? And one of the things I've recently learned that I think is so critical is that people that are are serving in geriatrics, their goal is to allow people who have the cognitive skills to maintain as much control as they can. That's right. That's right. And you have to relinquish that to them just because it's not the decision you would make for yourself does not make it a wrong decision. No, it's a it's a dance between... Yeah, that's a great description. I think it's a dance between wanting to help your parents and allowing them as much freedom and independence as possible. And it's not like any dance. Some people do it one way, some people do it another. You will kind of know if, if there's three or four falls and some, some damage has been done and maybe something's been broke. I mean, you know you're on the way to a broken hip, which can often be the end. Mm-hmm. So there's a time where the dance, maybe you need to take over and lead. Mm-hmm. And other times they may need to lead. But you just, you'll just you'll kind of have a feeling, yeah. I feel. It's one of those improvisation things I talked about. There's exactly. no set moment. Like a red light doesn't go on and say, this is the moment. That's right. And you have to sort of feel when the moment is. Mm-hmm. And it may be difficult. They may really fight you on that. That's true. But sometimes, true. The, again, sometimes tears and and even angry words should not stop you from doing what's right. Um, This is a great question. Do you have any suggestions for how to deal with a parent who is against any kind of external help despite needing it? I had an uncle that like that. You did. I did did. did have an uncle like that. And um, that was a challenge. It was a real challenge. Well, I mean, you know, that's that is tough. I, I think that again, trying to find a person, find to find the person who can best talk to that person. Mm-hmm. It may not be you, oh child. That's. It may be their best friend. It may be their their minister. Yeah. It may be exactly. uh, a neighbor, another exactly. relative. I don't know. find the person who is most likely to be able to get through exactly. to them. Exactly. And you know, another thing is if they have had friends who have just gone through a terrible time they've mm-hmm. seen their friends go through having uh, awful things happen because they weren't prepared mm-hmm. point that out that's right they and don't want to they don't want to be the same as that you know i do think that that is an important issue and i love the suggestion of bringing someone else into the conversation yeah. who may have uh, some abilities here you Till the day your parents left this earth, you were still their son. Absolutely. They were still the parent. And and when you look at that triangle, are you relating to each other as adult to adult, adult to uh, child? That is a very difficult scenario for a parent because when you come in, and particularly with those with dementia, they're getting younger. Sometimes, so are yeah. you. Yeah. you exactly. Go. You're Which now is tw- nice, kind of. That's right. At least they think I'm younger. If only. But they're going to treat you like you're 12 right. instead of, of uh, the fact that, that you have been in charge and you're the one with the, the powers of attorney and all of the rest. Um, you, 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 when happen. you said that, all of a sudden I had a flashback. I, I wasn't even men- going to mention this. I remember, well, maybe God, eight or nine years into this front process both parents were in the nursing home by this time and I had gone to uh, over to see them and I can't even remember what had happened but as I was I'd been talking to my father and there were several of his male friends around him when we had this conversation and I don't even remember what it was about but and I was heading down the hallway to leave and over my shoulder I could hear one of the guys say who was that man to my father mm-hmm. And he said, and I could hear this 
pride in his voice. He said, that was my son. And he said it in a way that he never said it to me in person. But I got in that moment uh, a connection that he wasn't able to share so easily one on one. A gift. It was a gift over my shoulder. Those over the shoulder gifts are great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let's see. What questions can you ask or what intangibles that you can look for to evaluate how much staff cares? Oh, that's great. That's a oh, I love great that. Great question. question. Hang out a lot at the, at the, at the facility. Mm -hmm. Have meals there. Hang out on, on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon. Listen. Observe. What, what's the tone of voice when the staff mm -hmm. talks to the resident? Mm -hmm. How much do they smile? Do they seem friendly? You can tell by tone of voice and look in their face and, and those other things if somebody's mm -hmm. caring or they're just going around and doing their job because they have to. Mm -hmm. You know, I, uh, we have a friend, Liz Cook, and she moved up to New York and her mother died and her father was in a nursing home in Oklahoma City. And Liz felt terrible because she couldn't get back that often. It's a long way. But one time she came back to see her dad, and, and she got there a little late, and he'd already gone to bed for the night. But she came by his room, and she saw this lips on his forehead, lipstick. <laughs> and she knew that his favorite nurse had given him a little goodnight kiss on his forehead. Mm, and that precious. meant so much to her. There is no money that can pay for that kind of care. You know, one of the things I would suggest after having uh, watched my father in care and um, other friends, uh, parents that, that I visit or serve communion to, um, I would suggest that you look to see how often, particularly with dementia, People are in their room, and how often they're out in community right. areas where Good they are idea. actually participating as much as they are able in life. I will tell you that the last week of my father's life, the caregivers still were getting him dressed mm. and into a mobile chair that they could bring him out with everybody else, even with his pneumonia, and in a, a, a kind of recliner so that he was participating in life right. as fully as possible. That's great. And I think that that's a key. Uh, I think going to all the events that they have is important. Oh. I mean, we had great worst fest events. They would have kind of a... Uh, you know, a fake beer and pretzels right. and everything else. No well, scotch? No scotch. <laughs> but anyway, one of the men that was there had actually been the burgermeister uh, for Lone Star for years. Mm. And he knew exactly how to celebrate uh, a German holiday, and uh, it, was a, it was a cute thing. But that also, all of those festivities... They mean really? a lot to them. It, it, absolutely. You know, I was telling you last night when we were talking about this, I was talking about my last time that my mother knew who I was. It was, very, well, it was so ironic because my father had just gone on hospice and he was, I just left his room in hospice and I had to walk from that about 50 yards to the big room where they're having the Christmas party, the number one social event of the year, packed with people and music and food. It was great. Well, what a transition that was. And I, I walked in. I was a little taken aback. And all of a sudden, I heard this music, and I kind of started dancing around a little because I needed a break. Of the thing. And was, the administrator came over and put a, a, a microphone in my hand. He said, Jim, sing for us. And I thought, sure. And I said, how about a holy night? And this piano player who looked like she was 100 said, I know it. And she says, what's your key? I said, I never did know. So <laughs> I said, let's go for it. She, she played Oh Holy Night 
And I sang it with everything I had, and it worked. Aww. And my mother was way at the back. She couldn't see me. But when she heard my voice over the she loudspeaker, knew. she turned to the person next to her and said, that's my boy. So she knew my voice after Even all those years. Moment. That's the last time she yeah. knew who I was. Music, music it does. is really, really a critical element. The other thing I would say about evaluating uh, uh, care staff is show up when you aren't expected. Oh, yes. Just do it. And I think you will find in most cases, people don't choose to, to even apply for this job unless they have a heart for it. And if it was not a match, they're going to know very quickly that, that this is well, not. Well, the turnover rate I was talking right. about. The that's turnover, right. and they they, if, they don't, if they don't get it, they're so, not going to stay there. So you can, you can certainly do that. Um, any more? Can we have any more questions? Or we got, how, we got five minutes left. How do you okay. handle when your parent has those rare moments of insight to how bad their dementia is? Um, well, you know, it is. It's hard to know. I mean, they, mm -hmm. you, they can be deep in dementia and yet have a moment where they're really right there with you. But it's usually like my mother mm -hmm. hearing my voice. It's mm -hmm. usually just a moment. moment. And if they go right back, that is just a miracle moment. Well, I, I want to talk a little bit. We got about could four be minutes that, left. Yeah. That that this um, uh, listener has uh, keyed on something that I was aware of. My own father, the fear is is really palpable for them as they are aware that they are losing yeah. uh, their abilities, and when they wake up one morning where they've always been and they don't recognize well, it, it's, it's terrifying. And he got up and left my house, and that set off a whole issue with police departments and everything else. To, we had to go find Daddy. Oh, he wow. was gone, and um, and that is terrifying. I think that that was one of my lowest points. Oh yeah, I was fearful, uh, but my mother wandered once, three blocks from the independent living. She was on the corner of the main highway in town. Mm. And a man, a kind person, saw her, realized what had happened, and took her back to the place. Exactly. I want to get this in before we run out of time. We have just covered a little bit of the presentation that I do, the joys and jolts <laughs> of caregiving, how to survive it with sanity and a sense of humor. If you are out there and you would like to have me come to your church or your association or organization, healthcare group, please feel free to give a call. I love talking about this. It, it touches my heart, and I think it helps people to ha be in the conversation. So if you're interested, please give us a call. Yeah. Absolutely. And Absolutely. I'd like to close by just saying, um, you know, the, um, caregiving is not easy. It's not without challenges, but it is enormously rewarding. It made me a better person. It allowed me to grow, and it allowed me to show up for my parents when they really needed me. And I got a chance to give back for all they had done to me. And over those years, we got closer. I mean, I got a closeness to my parents those last 14 years that I, I'd never had before. I wouldn't trade it for the world. Uh, words were said, the best part of a good person's life are the little moments of kindness and of love. Well, that's what we get to do as caregivers. That's right. those, those, we get to, to experience those moments of love. So what I say to you as we close is, when you show up for your parents, you're really letting God's spirit shine right through you. When you show up for them, you're really showing up for yourself. Wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Absolutely. We hope that you've uh, gotten something from today. It's been great being with you. Barb Rand has been so wonderful to do this with me. You know, we we were, worked together all those years, and we got to do it again here at about to be 75, both oh of us. Oh, my gosh. That's true. I hope we'll have our own caregivers. Yes, soon. indeed. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> Thanks so much.